Hello, good evening, and uh, welcome everyone to this uh, photo and online talk entitled Flora Photographica Showcase. My name is Danae Poncho. I'm a museologist, curator, and lecturer specializing in photography, currently serving as the director of the Photography Center in Geneva in Switzerland. And I am here tonight as the co-author with uh, William Ewing of Flora Photographica, a book on the flower in contemporary photography. Uh, joining me tonight are three of the many talented artists who participated in the project, Ellen Dagenan, Anne Shelton, and Abelardo Morel. Thank you very, very much for joining me tonight. And here is a brief um, outline of the talk for tonight. I will be doing a very brief introduction of the project as a whole, show you some content from the book, and then uh, we will let each of the artists do a brief presentation of their work and the importance and relevance of the flower in their particular practice. And then we'll have time for a discussion during which you are extremely welcome to ask any question you'd like, uh, in the Q&A box that you should see at the bottom of your screen in your screen, not your screen, in Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, and without further ado, I will uh, start with uh, the presentation of um, Flora Photographica, of course, not on the right slide. Here we go. So we've been through that uh, already. So Flora Photographica is a book exploring the motif of the flower in contemporary photography. Um, it is not the first book um, with the same title as uh, it has a predecessor published in 1990 by uh, William Ewing already, uh, which was covering um, the motif of the flower throughout the history of photography from its very beginning in the middle of the 19th century up to uh, what were then the contemporary period, so the end of the 1980s. And it is um, an absolutely delightful form of um, photography history from the point of view of the flower, if we can uh, say so. Um, and he was very interested into revisiting the theme seeing whether uh, the flower was still as important and relevant um, today for contemporary photographers as it was uh, until then. Uh, and the result of this research that we carried out over four or five years, I think, um, is this book carrying the same name, but focusing on the last 30 years, uh, and I would say leaning more heavily towards the last uh, 10 years. Um, and I realized when we organized the launch last week uh, in London that I am absolutely unable to speak about this project uh, without saying how much joy it was to research this topic uh, in many different ways, because the topic itself lends itself very well to something very joyful, colorful, boisterous at times. Um, but also because there were some particular challenges, I think, associated with this motif. We were always, with William, challenging each other. I do think that Cindy Schumann would have a really interesting flower. Do you think that this artist and that artist would have something interesting with flowers, even though they are not necessarily known for working with this motif? And a lot of the time, the answer was actually yes. Um, so we have many names that you would not expect having worked with flowers in the book and others like the three artists joining us tonight, uh, whose work uh, deals heavily with the many meanings of the flower and its relevance today. I will not be commenting um, every image that I will show you, uh, but I'd like to do uh, a brief comment on the image that you are seeing now. Um, so it's a female arm and hand, red nail polish, a white ribbon, white flowers. It looks joyful, it looks innocuous in a way, uh, but this is actually a very political image. Um, it was taken by a photographer named Jedrev Novicki uh, in 2020 in Minsk, in Belarus, and it is actually documenting the protest happening then where uh, carrying flowers or ribbons or even items of clothing of the colors of the opposition, which are red and white, was actually an extremely strong uh, political statement, something that could uh, risk you getting arrested uh, by the police. 
And I think this is an image that is quite representative uh, of the book as well. Uh, many images that we see here um, have a second hidden, sometimes symbolic meaning that is a lot more political than many of the images that were in the first uh, installment of Flora Photographica. Uh, and I will now very briefly take you through um, a whistle-stop tour of the book. We start with roots. We start with an exploration of how contemporary artists are uh, using not only the flower itself um, as a visual motif, but also art history as a source of inspiration um, and uh, thwarting or extending its codes uh, towards producing completely new and uh, very often unexpected images. Um, in situ, the second chapter uh, invites us to find flowers where they grow, be it like here in this image by Damen Noor in the field where they are grown for um, industrial production uh, to be sold then in the, in the entire world or in uh, delicate findings as one wanders through the streets. Inquiry is a chapter uh, dedicated to more scientific work, such as here the work of Nikki Simpson, one of the relatively few um, botanical uh, illustrator who uses photography instead of drawing, something that is still to this day slightly controversial. But you also find uh, other types of inquiry like this one in um, the history of botany and in uh, Rousseau's uh, research in, in botany in Switzerland, or some extremely constructed images like this picture by Rob Kessler, again, um, a scientific illustration that looks uh, like a very pristine and unique picture that is made uh, through dozens and dozens of images and then uh, colored um, artificially by hand to look like the real thing. Or more symbolic inquiries uh, like this of Mathieu Gafsou, uh, who is um, exploring in this work uh, the highs and the lows uh, of addiction here symbolized by the poppy flower. In arrangements, you will find arrangements, of course, uh, and here with a nod to the pandemic with the work of, Nadaria, uh, of Nadira Zakaria, uh, with the mask that has become the emblem of the last two years. But in this chapter, surprisingly enough, you will find a lot of portraitures, um, like this portrait of Jeff Koons uh, by Martin Schuller. A more expected, uh, unexpected arrangements uh, and extremely staged images. Essence is concerned with the single flower, with its textures, shapes, um, which is still to this day inspiring many artists and is still um, bringing on absolutely new images that we haven't quite seen before, uh, which was also for me one of the joy of this project, discovering how uh, even though the history of art is absolutely fully packed of flowers, contemporary artists are still managing um, to create new images, new shape to surprise us. Um, and this was really a highlight of, of my work researching the topic. And after essence, after the quintessential flower, we have the imposters. Um, bouquets, arrangements, flowers, which are quite not what they seem at first time, which are collage, uh, which are flowers made of plastic waste from the ocean, or which are artificial flowers from uh, the industry, such as this image by Vic Muniz. Hybrids is a form of continuation of this chapter. Uh, it has to do with manipulated images, with uh, new ways of using photography to create uh, images of flowers much more manipulated uh, images, sometimes staged uh, and sometimes worked in post-production. Fugue is more concerned uh, with the composition um, and how the flower is used uh, to give a particular rhythm to, um, to an image. Uh, it is probably one of the most joyful uh, chapter of this book, even though it ends in an explosion by Oregetsch. 
And finally, the last chapter is Reverie, uh, a book include uh, a, a chapter <laughs> including um, very different uh, iteration of flowers, taking us to entirely new and unexpected, unexpected worlds. Uh, also, um, I think of this chapter as an homage to the ingenuity of contemporary photographers and their um, unstoppable ability to surprise and, and amaze us. And so this is it for that uh, very, very brief introduction to the book, uh, which contains over 200 illustrations uh, by 130 artists, a uh, vast majority of them contemporary with a few uh, historical landmarks um, also included. And the three artists who are joining us tonight have a special relation with flowers and a very special way of photographing them. Um, which is why I've asked them to join us tonight. Uh, and without further ado, I will um, give the floor to Hélène, uh, for which I need to stop sharing my screen. Here we go. Okay, does that work? I hope so. I can see a nod, brilliant, okay. So um, the, the title for this kind of brief um, seven or eight minutes, Form to Flagrante, um, it, it will become clear, I guess. So um, I wanted to start by saying that I was actually once quoted um, about 10 years ago to someone called Colin Pantall, if anyone knows him, you have to move on from flowers. And then after that, actually, for about until now, continued actually to work with flowers and they've become an incredibly important part of my work. So, um, and I, I want to tell you about, um, I suppose how I've actually moved um, in my work over that time. Um, and uh, one of the things to tell you, I suppose, is that I work with a flatbed scanner. That's my camera. And it's like a, a digital equivalent of a photogram. So of course you, most of you, everybody will be familiar with Anna Atkins, um, you know, one of the greatest proponents of the photogram. And I guess where I started, I was a little bit frustrated that everyone actually just plonks a flower onto a piece of paper and makes a photogram. And I, and I wanted to do something different. And I thought, well, you know, what else apart from flowers? Surely there's something else. So in fact, I initially worked with found objects um, and uh, the two images here, you can see on the right hand side, I work with hair nets, and on the left hand side uh, with stockings and a whole variety of, of hosiery. Um, part of the reason I use a scanner, I'm in love with it as a, um, a medium, is because it shows incredible detail, incredible depth. Um, if you've never tried it, um, do, because you might never stop. Um, so my work actually, what it moved from, if you like, finding the objects that I worked with to making. And I show this little image quickly because it really was very influential on the work I was then to do. It's a tiny little Japanese warrior made by an artist. Um, and it was made from twisty ties. So this is something, you know, you might seal a loaf of bread with. It's a tiny little piece of wire. And I love the fact that you could make something out of a material that was so ubiquitous. The thing was that the effort, my own efforts were very um, organic in shape and they sort of curled and they moved and they entwined. And very quickly, I was thinking about the work of Carl Blossfeld. Um, and a key reason, um, he, he didn't become famous, if you like, until he was about 63 years old. A key reason he made his works was to um, get his students to pay attention. That's become my mantra. And again, pay attention, pay attention. It's always, you know, as, as photographers and artists, you know, just look. But that's the reason why he made the works and he devised his own lenses um, and he went ever closer. Um, and you can see on the right-hand side, um, the first book that was published um, called Er Formen der Kunst, um, which is archetypes of art. And people have responded to his work ever since. And I think this is mainly because we recognize nature as a perfect model for so many things. 
Um, you know, if you think of all the shapes in fashion and design in architecture, um, you know, as humans, we go to nature, we, we try to copy it, we try to emulate the most incredible and beautiful forms. Um, but somehow our own efforts somehow always fall short. And this is where, you know, I was busy making, trying so hard, um, not only to copy nature, but in a sense I was, you know, I was um, working with his seminal photographs to try to recreate them. It was almost impossible. Um, and it wasn't actually until I realized that I had to kind of embrace the imperfections in the work in order for that work to be resolved. So I was therefore then working um, between the sort of, you know, the, the perfection and the imperfection of things, um, which is very much a kind of um, a theme in my, in my work. But just about the time that I was finishing that work, um, I had access to my own garden and for the first time in many years. And I was able to look really closely at the plants that were growing in the garden. And it started a really intense um, photographic relationship with some of them. Um, and I've got hundreds of photographs, uh, well, scans actually, of particular varieties. So what you see here is a plant called acanthus. Um, and you might be familiar because you have been most likely to see it adorning sort of Corinthian columns. Um, I looked ever closer, ever harder, I started to dissect things. So what you see here is a series of images. Um, I was dissecting, if you like, the fruit of acanthus at this stage. So I'd gone, gone from the main plant and I'd looked at every possible stage. And this is where I'm looking at the fruit. And um, I don't know about any of you, but I hadn't really thought about, um, the, if you like, this part of plants, which I probably, you know, maybe studied in biology at school, but I was intensely struck by how sexual plants are. And it was a kind of a revelation in a way. And, um, and for example, when I started to research the scientific terms for what I was looking at and observing, I discovered how closely aligned everything is um, with the human sexual, with human sexual reproduction. I called the series Sex Pistils. So um, you may or may not know that a sex pistil um, is the female reproductive part of the flower. And I found myself writing, um, the fruit of acanthus is a shapely house of seeds, ripe and bursting with sexual analogy. It's an unfolding drama of fecundity, gestation, expulsion, fruition. So for example, um, I'll go back to that image. Uh, this image is, is in the book um, and it shows us kind of protection and nurturing of the seed. So this particular part of the fruit is showing um, something actually scientifically is called the gynoceum, and that's a Greek word made up of two words, woman and house. So I was getting extremely interested in how this kind of correlation with the plant world and the human world, and it just went on and on in the most extraordinary way. And the more I research, for example, um, this image here, um, I, some of the wording that was used to describe um, what I was seeing. So for example, here you can see um, this part of the, uh, the fruit and the seed inside. And then this protuberance is actually called a jaculator, um, which slightly blew my mind because of this. Um, and also it's because of the, you know, it expulses the seed. <laughs> so for me, it was incredibly um, surprising and rich in all its possibilities in terms of this, the plant and human world um, correlation, albeit on a very small level. Um, and the other thing, you know, for example, you know, if this process of expulsing the seed fails, um, then the seed withers, the ovary chambers dry, sometimes the ovary bursts with such force that it's blown apart and is irreparably damaged. Um, and I could sort of go on and on about these sort of um, incredible connections between the images and the words um, and the kind of allegorical aspects. So having discovered sex, um, I was only a step away from my current preoccupations, um, which are actually far more to do with culture. So 
um, what I wanted to try to explain was that so I started off very much with form um, and then got into sort of perhaps a bit of science and thinking allegorically and now this the work that I'm continuing to do which is very much part of a large project um, way way too much way too big to handle almost um, is about it's about culture it's about politics um, because plants and flowers have actually defined women uh, for centuries and so our character has been shaped and molded by deep-seated notions of the innocent to the erotic and everything else in between and it's, this is a huge subject so I can only really say that much um, at the moment but I would say you know my current preoccupation would be with the language and culture of flowers um, and so this is a piece of work um, which I won't begin to explain um, and I want to show you one more piece of work um, you know where I'm again using and working with language um, and I just want to leave you with sort of some questions really um, or thoughts where you know if you've only got to stop and consider the culture of the virgin for example um, and all that that might entail in terms of flower language and for example a work like deflowered um, so yeah I will just leave you with that um, as a kind of um, yes yeah, indicative of what I'm working on now and um, yeah thank you very much for that whistle stop tour <laughs> okay thank you very very much um, and so the next presentation uh, will be by Anne Shelton and I will be uh, the one sharing the slides and my screen here we go, except we are not where we should be. Sorry. Yeah, apologies. I should have put that back where it should be. Uh, here you go. The floor is yours. Um, Good morning. It's morning for me here in Aotearoa. And thanks so much to our hosts, Photo London and Dane and William for their enterprise and labor in this incredible looking publication. I can't wait to see it. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about a series of work of mine called Jane Says. Uh, it's ongoing since 2013 and looks at the histories of plants that can be used to control the female reproductive body. So I use uh, female here in an expanded and non-exclusory sense. So the plants I'm looking at are amenagogic or abortificient in nature. And an amenagogue will bring on menstruation and an abortificent will end a pregnancy. I've also included plants used in concoctions made for contraceptive and abortive purposes, uh, such as opium or valerian, as it's the conversation, uh, part of a recl reclamation of these often oral histories of wise woman's knowledge that I'm wanting to activate. I first came across these plants um, that controlled these bodily functions in the works of trailblazing New Zealand feminist Margaret Sparrow in her books on the history of abortion in Aotearoa. And we see Sparrow's collection of contraceptive pill packs on screen uh, with some, some quite terrifying names. As you know, plants don't grow on demand and, and many flower only once a year and very briefly and they might not be available at the standard nursery or garden center. So I grow plants and I've got things growing in every little nook and cranny in my garden. And more and more, I also forage and collect on my cycle trips and other travels. We've got a bit of an action pet, uh, shot here of my loaded up bike and my partners. Uh, I'm not a, a botanist and, uh, or an experienced gardener. So I might not get to grow a plant um, I might get to know a plant one year and then not be able to photograph it until the next, for example. And this is one of the reasons why the series is ongoing. I'm interested in how this body of work connects directly to feminist discourse and to feminisms. And I'm interested in how photographically it also connects to these histories and to how women in the Western context have practiced art making in the domestic space and then emerged from that space in the 19th century. So for instance, figures like Julia Margaret Cameron, who used her garden and her children as subjects in her artwork. 
For this reason, I'm looking at the studio space as a kind of domestic gendered site. And I'm attempting to strike up a conversation with this artistic lineage. Within this, and in a slightly broader sense, I'm also referencing the tradition of still life photography and floral or botanical art and women's roles as major contributors in this sphere. As a young person, I learned floral art. And when I was a little older, I coveted a set of Ikebana International magazines that I carried from flat to flat. And in many ways, these magazines extended the aesthetic armature for Jane Says. The photographs in these magazines had colored backgrounds that packed a punch of color that seemed to me to be right out of second wave feminism in the 1970s. And later, when I began making my own works with these barely dampened primary colors, I saw my isolated arrangements as striking, in striking pots as plant portraits, invoking the physical presence of women who needed these plants and who used them at critical and traumatic moments in their lives. An absent female presence has long been a part of my work and these plant portraits have eventually come to embody a long list of female archetypes, not dissimilar to the ones we've just um, seen from Elaine. I took Ikebana classes in the early 2010s and it was there that the tools and techniques of this art appeared to me as highly relevant to this series. As you, make, um, as you make Ikebana practice arrangements, you work through a series of exercises which are very structured and formulaic. And I understood in a very bodily sense that the practice of Ikebana is not only about a certain peering back of nature and a great reverence for it, but it also appeared to me to be about a sense of manipulation of it. Think cutting, folding, contorting and removing elements. You can see some of that folding uh, in the previous image. There's also a recognition of the boundless power of nature and within a set of rules and restrictions, a certain acquiescence to that power. These concepts and assertions fell into place for me and I saw an alignment. I wanted to ask a set of questions around regulation. How are women's bodies controlled in our society? How are technologies articulated around these bodies? I wanted to focus in on how the female body is caught again, and it's not the first time, in this quite violent and difficult moment, particularly but not solely in the US. The witch, who features in Flora Photographica, continues to be a maligned and misunderstood figure who has literally been persecuted to death. The holder of ancient wisdom and of old herbal knowledge from a time when the function and aesthetic of plants were not yet separated by capitalism and the rise of Christianity. The hysteric who reminds us of the incarcerating and so-called medical controls placed on women who transgress the gender codes designated them by patriarchal Victorian and colonial traditions is also featured in Flora Photographica. And um, she reminds me of figures like Augustine, from Charcot's infamous experiments on so-called hysterics. The courtesan, which depicts Poroporo, which was used in Aotearoa by Māori as a contraceptive, is featured here and is also um, featured in the book. Uh, the Encyclopedia of New Zealand Tiara states that while Poroporo's efficacy is unknown, it was farmed commercially in Aotearoa in the 1970s for use in contraceptive pills. It's important to note that this word work was made with the permission of local indigenous knowledge holders. Jane Says positions the wise woman as a critical linchpin in the history of misogyny in the West, and photography has played a role in her subjection too, through its maintenance of the primacy of vision. But photography is also a force for change, of course, and has been co-opted for its agential potential. This conflicted position that photography embodies is a productive space for me, a messy nexus where I, find, where I attempt to push the medium around a bit, if you like. So while abiding photography's surface, I attempt to draw a viewer in, in precise, precisely through the same mechanism that I'm critiquing. I also combine my photographic production with printed matter that you can see here 
and performance as a means by which to draw out the depth of the research material that I'm amassing. And Jane says, these two components share a text, a manifestation of the work of analysis, selecting, cutting up, and reassembling quotations. By working through diverse source material and literally combining these quotations into a narrative, it's a process not dissimilar to constructing a plant arrangement. And I'm reconnecting and, re and resurfacing that history, giving it a new skin. And you've just seen some images of the performance in the poster. And just to finish up, um, I wanted to mention that Jane says has fostered the crucible of a new body of work, which is entitled I Am an Old Phenomenon, and which premieres um, in New York in November at Denny Dimmon Gallery. And this series delves further into this area, prefacing the figure of the wise woman or the witch and her relationship to plants. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you very much for this very engaging presentation. And last but not least, of course, we have Abelardo Morel, who will uh, present his work uh, with flowers, flowers for Lisa. Hey, Max. Sorry. Sorry, just give me a second. Can you see it? Hi, uh, thank you, Dana. Um, also, I'm delighted to be on with uh, Elaine and uh, and Anne. Um, it's it's nice to see other makers uh, showing their work. It's it's so such an individual act that it's always a pleasure to just see the process of it. Uh, when I began making pictures of flowers, it was uh, informed by my wanting to give my wife a so flowers for her birthday. And then I thought, oh, maybe I can make a picture of flowers instead, you know, uh, why not? Then I started thinking about flowers and how many different influences I've had over the years and in, in the history of, of art, you know, from Bruegel to Georgia O'Keeffe, Manet, Warhol, Maplethorpe, Irving Penn, Joan Mitchell. I mean, the list goes on. And so in some ways it was a very daunting uh, project that I took on because I thought, what hasn't been done with flowers already? Uh, but I, I, I welcomed that limitation. And by limiting it, um, I thought that I would try to uh, discover a certain sense of invention and, and energy to, to look at flowers maybe for the first time in my life. Uh, it resulted in a book. Uh, I made 76 pictures of flowers for my wife. And, and these are some of the works from, from that book. Um, Again, that sense of invention took over me. And in some ways I wasn't limited by what has been done before. I wanted to create new ways of inventing flowers for myself as if I had just discovered the subject. So these are some of the pictures that I've made. And in some ways I wanted to, um, you know, I would make a picture, then I thought, okay, let's start over again and 
kind of come up with a new idea of picturing flowers. So it was very productive uh, time for me, but it was also sort of very neurotic. Oh my God, what's next? What is it, what's possible in terms of um, the arrangements here or mixing paint with flowers? And in some cases I painted a canvas, a piece of wood where I would put flowers and make multiple exposures and you know, blend the two mediums together in ways that I hadn't done before. In this case, it's uh, a vase that I painted, but then roses are added to it in multiple exposures. And then I would paint again. So uh, what resulted was uh, to me, uh, you know, a Gerhard Richter painting in some ways. I'm very much taken by especially the work of um, 17th century Dutch painters and their flower pictures. And they're just, they're unbeatable. They're so gorgeous and, and uh, physically palpable that in some ways, you know, it's difficult to, to, to try to make something like it. So what I did was to collage some things from books, but um, allude, allude to that period but create a kind of a new statement about them. In some ways it was through dedication to them. This is a, a Ellsworth Kelly drawing that I took, but I perforated um, a sheet, uh, basically uh, using his drawing to create a, a kind of a new version of, of what he did. Same thing with the Louise Bourgeois drawing. Uh, that I love of a flower. And it's a sacrilege, you know, to puncture someone else's work, but I wanted to sort of re remake the sort of the, the wonder of her piece. And this is from uh, Alice in Wonderland that I've worked before, a Lewis Carroll idea of a glass or a mirror or a window changing the nature of reality as you cross it by using flowers. And this is a Van Gogh book that I painted and then lit with flashlights. Van Gogh uh, comes up a little bit at the end of this thing. Douglas Sirk, a wonderful filmmaker whose work I love. And then this is a little clip, very short clip from Vertigo, uh, Hitchcock's masterpiece. So I took, I, I, lo I love Hitchcock so much that I took a, a quotation from that film and had someone make me that same bouquet uh, and, and photograph it. So it was in memory and after Hitchcock. But what's interesting, this is the last picture in my book, but after this picture, I decided to do a whole project on Hitchcock. So one thing led to another. Um, I've also been painting lately, not paintings per se, but photographing paint uh, in changing ways so that the, the details of my paint become photographs. And some of them really do feel like floral in a way. 
which is interesting. I'm not, again, I'm not gifted as a painter, but I can make marks in ways that feel uh, like my love for flowers. And then uh, to end, I've devised this thing called a, a tent camera, where it has a, it, this tent has a periscope looking at the world that projects on the ground, whatever is around the tent. I went to Giverny uh, a while ago to photograph in Monet's garden. This is one of his paintings. This is my tent looking at Monet's uh, garden. So again, flowers come back uh, in, in my way of work, making works. A gardener uh, in and the house and the idea of flowers being seen on the ground attracts me very much. I'm going to uh, South of France in June to try to make pictures of Van Gogh's work in some ways. Now I have a much smaller tent where I can look at what Van Gogh looked at. And here is what he saw in the South of France. Uh, so, uh, nothing to show yet, but this is uh, my hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. We really look forward to see what comes up of these um, installations. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Please keep us posted. Um, well, thank you to all three of you. Uh, it was really brilliant to get some insights uh, on the way you, you, the three of you work. Uh, <laughs> I think this is something I've been absolutely starved off, starved off during the pandemic where we couldn't really get much insights and discussions of, of how artists actually work and a lot of our exchanges making the book are pretty straightforward. We are doing this, are you interested? I need that kind of file in that resolution and so on. So it's, I feel like we are finally <laughs> catching up. Um, and I do have many questions for you, um, but obviously this is uh, very much open to our audience. If you have questions for any of the artists, you can use the Q&A box. It's easier for me to use um, than, the, um, than the chat. So don't hesitate to ask questions. And if you want to ask um, one artist in particular, uh, just let us know in the, um, the Q&A box if your question is open or for someone specifically. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, there is one thing that I'd like to ask, uh, actually the three of you, um, because all of your images are extremely constructed, uh, not just in terms of the making of the image, um, but as well in terms of all the research that goes um, into making an image, be it historical, be it visual, be it a deep dive into uh, history of art or the history of medicine. Um, I'd like to, to ask each of you to tell us a little bit more about the research process um, in your work. Um, maybe uh, starting with you, Abardo. Well, um, since I have a big studio now, um, I've been collecting more and more and more art books uh, now that I'm a certain, of a certain age, I can sit down and listen to Bach if I want to and look at hundreds of books. So I've been looking at books, uh, lots of images from the beginning to now of people who made flower pictures. And uh, you know, the, the result is that it's an endless subject. Just when you think uh, flowers are passe, uh, no way, it, it, there's, they speak in modern ways to all of us. How about you, Anne? I think um, the, the construction of my images, you know, has, as I mentioned in my talk, this kind of parallel with, with my research process. And, um, you know, I'm really interested in photography, the fact that it is this medium of surface and trying to somehow disrupt that through um, printed matter and performance components. And so the research is often manifest in those areas. Um, so, you know, my, my, my process is, you know, read, reading widely and in really completely diverse sort of areas and then trying to reconstruct that somehow um, to, to, I guess, re-examine and 
you know, in some sense, reclaim um, knowledge, which is, you know, a, a lot of which has been lost because it was carried um, through oral um, histories. Um, but also there is a definitely a groundswell in terms of rec reclaiming that knowledge um, and kind of reactivating it and representing it. And so I think the, the process is really part of that. Um, and I also, just in terms of, you know, I, I, I do construct the images myself and that can be an incredibly difficult process. <laughs> Um, you know, sometimes it takes three days and obviously plants die and they don't really like studio lights. So, um, you know, there's a lot of, um, I guess there's a lot of time that goes into that side of it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. the research, some aspects of the research uh, are the tr through the traditional means and some um, yeah, even through the making of the work in some sense. Thank you so much for, for sharing this. Uh, and uh, how about you, Elaine? Um, I, I guess um, the thing that I've really noticed in my work is that I've moved from the, the found to the made or the constructed, and that's really significant. Um, you know, I didn't realise that how much I love sculpture. Um, people sometimes say, you know, is it is it the object that you make or is it the final image? And so far it's always been you know, the means to getting to the image. Um, so whatever I make um, usually ends up on the scanner or as a photograph. Um, and the other thing to add to that is that um, I found it interesting when at the book launch, I think you, Dane, mentioned that I think it was like 80% of the work in the book is color, uh, in color. Um, and so this very small amount of work is in black and white. And that's very important to me so far in that I always have to somehow yeah, always pair back on, on colour. It always has to be stripped back to kind of bear, not bare essentials, but something that is incredibly um, simple. Um, so yeah, that's 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 something important to my work, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Um, and there's also one thing that interested me because this was also very much part of the research when we were working on the book uh, with William as well. Um, or talking about the project to people and it's always, oh, you're doing a bit of flower. Hmm. Nice, you know, it was, <laughs> this was also a very interesting challenge for me to um, bring the whole um, breadth of, the, of this topic uh, into the book and, and show that even images like the first one, which seemed very innocent and, and joyful, actually have something extremely uh, political. Uh, as well, which is not the case of every image of the book, doesn't have to be, obviously, but it's still we have a strong percentage, um, strong uh, part of the book that is uh, very political, which might be uh, quite unexpected for the topic, but also uh, when you see some of the images, you don't necessarily guess uh, what's behind. You have to, to read the caption, the title, to understand the layers and layers of the work. Um, and I'd like to know who you uh, approach also a topic that is, um, you know, by reputation seems very innocent and very female and sometimes even uh, a little bit superficial while your work, um, Hélène and Anne, is actually quite political. Who was the question for? Sorry? <laughs> Who was the question for first? Oh, uh, Anne and Elaine. Um. Maybe I'll go first because I've got a feeling Anne's going to be so brilliant on this. That I'll just get my little bit done. <laughs> I think, I, I mean, again, I want to sort of refer to, you know, I, I, I really, I actually still have a problem talking about working with flowers for, for the reason you've just said, Dane, because, you know, the word pretty or beautiful or you know it's really troublesome to me but I didn't go straight to the work I'm doing now you know it, it it's just it, it's come upon me slowly and just this realization you know I I grew up for example um you know pressed flowers you know they they were kind of you know like they were um you know I, I come from the sort of the cult of the catholic tradition which thank goodness I have left well and truly behind but you know flowers were so embedded in that and I did not realize you know just how political that was um it and now it shocks me you know because again you know as a mature 
female, I just realized all this stuff that was kind of partly very accepted um, that I now rail against. And, <laughs> and my work is going to get more and more angry, probably. Um, you know, and, and so that's why I ended up with, you know, uh, you know, my thinking now. And well, it has actually been probably for about the last sort of five years. The work's not really out there yet. There's this huge sort of body of work that's collecting, which is about being quite an angry female um, with all this kind of recognition of how we've been shaped. Um, you know, and I, I, I can only say in this brief moment, you know, sort of between the innocent and the erotic and everyone in between and how that's had such an impact. So, you know, I'm, um, I'm just fascinated by the culture of flowers now. Thank you. I guess I'm all about the maligned flowers or the flowers that have this kind of underbelly of, of something else that are unpredictable and um, that don't, you know, that, that might conform on a superficial level to those, um, you know, delicate um, narratives. But uh, I guess for me, flowers, they're a bit of a gateway drug to plants. And with my practice, I'm really trying to um, shift our connection to nature and I think you know this is this is a way that that I can lead people in and um, and and focus on uh, plants beyond their aesthetic appearance if you like mm -hmm. and and I guess also the 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 beautiful flower in a conventional sense is is also not so innocent for me you know it is a toxic flower you know many commercial flowers are treated you know literally you know ten, you know they're, they're sprayed literally tens of times before they get to us in in the market and you know they are transported around the world and in particular environments at great cost to our environment and um, so there were all these other aspects of this sort of the the I guess the highly commercial plant that aren't as uh, kind of pretty as they look, so, yeah. Okay. And one question, one question um, for you, Abelardo, is, um, um, I guess all three of you could actually also be concerned with it, is there is, uh, as, you, as you showed us, um, such an overabundance of flowers in the history of art. Um, and how do you, who are you not uh, overly burdened or overwhelmed with these hundreds and thousands of representations? Um, because I guess I would, as an artist, which I am not, but I would feel quite quite squashed by this weight of, of history. And how do you work to be inspired to be referencing these flowers while still doing your own? I'm very interested to know what your secret is. Well, as, and first of all, I'm an artist. Uh, you know, no, no shame in that. <laughs> um, so, as an artist, I have, I'm neurotically, constantly thinking of ways to make art, and and that by that I mean ways of expressing myself and digging into subjects that I had no idea about. So, um, to me. Uh, what, the challenge of so many flower pictures around there. And some people think, you know, flowers is just pretty or whatever. It's, I, I, I welcome things like that because it's a way to say, okay, here's my take on this. And it, it, it enlists powers, some unknown powers in me to try to come up with something fresh. Uh, and that's sort of my mission to look at something and make it new. And were you at some point, uh, as Ren said, also um, bothered in any way by the fact that flowers is considered uh, a feminine and a pretty topic? Was it ever something no. you were bothered about? No, no. I mean, I'm, I'm a human being and the idea of flower or uh, subjects belonging to one person or another or one class or another bothers the shit out of me. Because you know I'm, I'm Cuban born, and uh, some people think, well, why doesn't your work look like a Cuban uh, artist? 
you know, no, no, limitations are not for for us. So no, I I I love that something in me weeps inside too with flowers and thinks about sex and thinks about all kinds of things. No, so please, limitations are not allowed. Thank you. We we very much agree. And I have to say when we're researching the book. Uh, at some point was a question, how is it going to be balanced in terms of, of genders? And we didn't establish any quota, we didn't have any specific goal when we were in the research stage. And very organically, um, around 50% of the artists were female, 50% male. I think we can very uh, firmly say that flowers um, in contemporary photography is not a male or a female topic. Um, I think it means that male artists can um, do flowers photograph, finally, we are here. Uh, but I think also, um, and hopefully, uh, a female artist uh, dealing with flowers in their work is not going to be pigeonholed, pigeonholed uh, into you know, being classified as someone doing this uh, pretty typically female topic. Um, at a minimum, this is uh, what I hope for. Uh, and we're extremely happy to see that quite naturally we had a, a very good uh, gender balance within the project. And within the generations as well, I think um, we, have, we are really covering uh, a lot of ground, the younger artists in the book being uh, 26, I think. Like, like me. Exactly. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I didn't even ask, but do you have questions for each other, maybe? The presentations. That's hard. That stumped uh, us, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to, I just realized I, I hadn't even asked, which felt uh, a little bit rude. I guess, Elaine, it's really interesting. You talked about imperfection as being kind of key to your work. And, you know, I'm also interested in, in oral histories and they're not always tidy bundles of, of factual information. So there's there's that element of slip, slippage and, and also with flowers, you have an element of myth and or urban myth even you know, about the meanings of plants and maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that, those sort of um, moments of, of slippage and failure. <laughs> That's easy. No, there was some, um, yeah, there's so much failure involved in that. No, it was actually, it was really interesting because I, you know, I, I think I started to explain, well, you know, I started to make these things um, and you know, realizing this connection with Blast Felt and then going like, oh, I should recreate, you know, some of these images. And so then it became a, it was so hard to do. And I'd set myself some real constraints in that I was only going to use a certain length of these twisty ties. And um, so I just have to connect them together and maybe either some sellotape or a piece of cotton. And that was it. And I had to do, and, um, and I, actually had many moments where I you know I'd be sitting in my kitchen making these women things and I had my image for reference and really trying so hard and um, getting very caught up in this uh, making this perfect copy of Blossfelt who was photographing you know plants and I was like I really doubted myself hugely um, and I thought this is you know, the kind of work I've never seen the lights before. It's ridiculous. I'm, you know, I fit, really felt like I was taking quite a risk. Um, it's actually my partner who encouraged me to, you know, to keep, no, you're onto something, just keep going, keep going. Um, and I, oftentimes with work, because I, I make, I don't know, you know, make work quite intuitively in a way, you know, I'm responding to all sorts of things that interest me. And so I, I never felt quite resolved with the work until I realised um, actually, hang on a minute, perfection. This is, you know, there's a lot to do with me and some of my traits and like get over it, you know, actually uh, you're a human being. This is the whole point of the work. Show 
your fixings, show your ties, show, show that you as a human being, you are not, you know. So it was really, really important to me. Um, and it was just, I don't know whether you have that feeling in your works, but just feeling this is resolved in my head. So now I can finish it. Um, yeah. And actually, of course, it's, 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 a, it's a big thing to talk about, isn't it? Perfection, imperfection, a constant sort of tension for any well, artist. Yeah, there is a tension there, isn't there? Because I think we've all three of us got quite prescribed parameters around what we want to do and, you know, for various reasons. But those moments of failure in inverted commas can often be so productive. And I, I guess also it's sometimes it's in the making and the actual doing and the embodiment of that mechanic that you actually find the way forward. And I think, you know, I don't know how you do it, Abelardo, but you seem to just do that over and over again. Your process is so inventive. Well, you should see the wastebasket. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, because for every picture, there's tons of failures. Uh, people don't get to see that. But it is part of, once you get over the feeling, feeling pissed off, then the next morning there is a kind of a renewal or uh, I mean that's what I love about art there's a certain uh, renovation that happens uh, in one's spirit you know um, so the subject in itself is so sort of giving you clues as to what you think you are and what you really are and you know it's 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 a way of consulting with with the world about who who and what you are so I, I love that relationship better than a shrink. <laughs> yeah. And guess, sorry, go ahead. I, I was just wanted to add to that because um, you, you made me also think, and your and your work in a sense, um, Abe is. Um, I think such a key part of making work is about play. Um, it's like just what if, and yeah. you know, I think one advantage of being that little bit older, maybe, um, or at least I like to think, is this you go like. Well, let's just try this what's going to happen you know you can't ever make work unless you just kind of you know you start trying um so yeah i just want to say you know play experiment it, is yeah key. no uh, play is is key and and uh, i think of uh, calder's work i mean there's a movie about he, he was 80 or 90 or something and he's in his studio and he's playing with sticks and and it really is the key to invention you know because if you don't think about your gallery or the reviewers or all that, there's a lot to play with. <laughs> yeah, it brings us back to Dane's question. I think, you know, the secret is, is just to really keep focused on what you're doing mm -hmm. and not what, not what everybody else is doing. Oh, very much, very much. Yeah. And I think that's also something that is um, present in, in in all of your work uh, and also in the book as a whole that this is most of these images are extremely personal even though they don't necessarily um, feature a person or anything uh, suggestive or directly erotic or uh, anything like this there is um, a very strong intimacy in the topic and the way it is approached um, by a lot of the artists uh, featuring the book and also by all three of you even if it's not self-portrait i think we can feel through your presentation also how much of yourself can be found uh, in the work um, which in my mind is also what is making them extremely touching um, even though they're extremely minutely uh, constructed but at the same time they also feel very effortless um, in a very positive uh, meaning of the of the word I think about William Carlos Williams, um, the poet's line about no ideas, but in things. I think the three of us have chosen to work through things, uh, to, to work out some kind of philosophy or anger or delight, but it is, is these little things that carry the weight of us you know and, and i think in some ways it's different from being a philosopher and writing a book about it uh we're just choosing parts of the world to speak for us so and, I, and i'm just delighted to be in this company 
Well, thank you very much for sharing all of this uh, with us. It's the kind of conversation I think we've all been missing a lot through, but I mean, even though we're still doing it over Zoom, but couldn't have happened differently this time since we are all in different parts of the world. Um, does any of you have anything they'd like to add to the last question? Where's my book? <laughs> Well, <laughs> I have news. <laughs> is now in the UK. Uh, so the boat has arrived, as far as I know. And uh, the first copies will be, uh, there's a few left at Flowers Gallery in London. A few more copies uh, will be available at Photo London on the TNH booth. And in a couple of weeks, we should be able to send uh, your copies finally. Um, I think Elaine can, can agree that it's beautifully printed. Um, and I think that you'll oh, great. love you very much. We will really love it very much. Well, Elaine and Anne and Danae, uh, it's been a pleasure and um, fun to do, actually. Not, not scripted, but, you know, us. Uh, thank you for doing it. Mm, yeah, I, I would say the same thing as well, actually. Um, uh, the book launch uh, the other night it, it was a very um I don't know there, there was a very such, I, I didn't anticipate it in a sense but a, a particular joy about being involved in this entire project um because of the breadth the scope the care that's gone into thinking you know those beautiful chapter names like you know I, I was kind of was it there's what's that wonderful chapter name now? Oh, imposters. So I was really happy to be an imposter. Um, but <laughs> it just was, yeah, it's just a joy to be part of it. And um, yeah, I, I can attest to its um, quality. And yeah, everybody should think about, you know, getting a copy one way or another. <laughs> I, I also wanted to talk about the chapters and thank you. Um, for, for the beautiful structure of the book. I, I'm particularly interested in the roots chapter because um, that's really relevant to my, my new work. Um, and it, yeah, it just seemed that laying, layering that kind of fresh structure over, as you say, uh, an area of um, art history that, that might have some stereotypes attached to it is a really wonderful way to approach it. And I can't wait to see it. Um, and thank you so much um, for, somehow finding me <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I just want to say there was a question in the chat about um my show in New York and I just wanted to say it's at, at Denny Dimon Gallery who you can find on Instagram if, if people are interested to go um to come along and see it it's in November Brilliant. I'll come and see it oh awesome <laughs> thank you Perfect. And um, anyone else has um, an upcoming show or book they'd like to mention? All right. <laughs> then I think we can um, free our audience. Thank you very, very much, everyone, for joining us uh, tonight. We hope you'll be able to see the book and that you will uh, enjoy it as much as we enjoyed making it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I guess we stay and smile until the end of the... <laughs> <laughs> Abe's gone already. <laughs> <laughs>